Next one. Question three, true or false? A Christian does not have to believe Jesus still has human flesh to be saved. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I would say true. Um, you know, there's all kinds of theological uh, questions uh, that uh, as we the years go by and we study more and more and we find answers in the scripture sometimes, and sometimes we say, well, there's nothing in the scriptures about this. And so we, 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 we don't know. But uh, over, over time, we, we get more and more answers. Uh, but we don't have to have all those answers before we can be saved. So if the question is, we have to understand this before a person can get saved, uh, I, I say no. Um, uh, what, the, what you need to understand, I believe, is what I would uh, say. I, I, when I'm going to share the gospel, I want to make sure they understand Jesus is God Almighty. And I want to make sure they understand that salvation is a gift. It's not earned through your works but it's a gift Jesus gives you because you trust him and he paid for your sins and gives you eternal life because of your faith in him. And I want them to understand that when you get the gift, you're born again. You can't ever get unborn again. It can't ever be reversed. So it's, you have eternal security. Eternal life is guaranteed to the believer. So uh, these are the things that I think that a person really has to under, understand and believe. Uh, uh, the question about the flesh, and, and this is something that wasn't even resolved in the church for probably, I would say, at least, I'd say around, it was around 380 AD when they uh, did the uh, revised Nicene Creed. Uh, you know, they... They, they had ecumenical councils uh, to discuss this Godhead, trying to figure it out. By scripture say there's one God, but the scripture says Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit's God, and God, the Father is God, and yet there's one God. So they, it took them centuries of Newton and, and many meetings among the leading theologians to try to figure out how to understand that and put it into words. So to expect that a, a, before a person could be saved, that they had to have all that sorted out in advance, I think is a, is a mistake. That's something that we had to deal with with uh, people we used to work with, uh, that, that they were expecting that basically a person had to know so much that you can't get saved until you're actually an, a theologian. You have really have all these theological things all uh, uh, resolved before you can even get saved. So... Uh, we, we, our conclusion is that there's only a few basic things a person has to understand and believe in order, in order to be saved. And then after that, if they are diligent studying the scriptures, then they will, you know, these other things and questions will be answered. All right. Uh, Renee, what do you say? Yeah. Well, I mean, the Bible does say anybody that denies Jesus come in the flesh is antichrist. So, you know, if they deny he was a real person and didn't die physically, because if he didn't die, if he wasn't God who manifested in the flesh as a man, then he couldn't die for our sins. So there's that problem. But I, I've never seen anybody that didn't believe Jesus was a real person get saved. So I don't I don't think that's a, a problem. I have I, I do get concerned when they start denying his pre-existence, denying his divinity. Uh, that's very concerning for me. But to be saved, they just need to understand that he is the Lord. He is the Christ. He lived a sinless life. He died for their sins, was buried and rose again bodily from the dead. Now, there's the issue. If they don't believe he physically rose, then. They have, where's their hope? Because our hope is in the fact that he rose again and one day we will too. So uh, the way it's worded does not really specify what it means by human flesh. So it's very difficult to answer this question because part of the gospel is understanding he had a bodily resurrection. And yes, they do need to believe that. So because the question is, 
not real clear on what it means, I can't say one way or the other. All right, Jordan, what do you say? Yeah, I would definitely say it's false. If the person's alluding to the fact in this question that, like, can a person, like, yeah, I believe Jesus rose again. I just don't necessarily believe um, that it was the same body or that he exists in heaven today with flesh. Um, that's how, that's kind of the context that I'm reading behind it, because obviously you, part of the gospel is you have to understand the resurrection. But even then, if wherever you fall in this spectrum of your understanding, you absolutely have to understand that Jesus rose again in the same body that he was crucified in. That is the power of the gospel. Jesus rose from the grave and he rose in that same body that was put in a tomb and then removed from a tomb and is the same glorified body that ascended into heaven. If you don't understand that, you don't understand the gospel. I'm not saying that it's an easy thing to fully comprehend, just like the Godhead, eternity. These things aren't things we can possibly comprehend with our finite mind, but that's where faith comes in, and that's why we are called to respond to the gospel in faith. So if you do not believe that Jesus currently is residing in heaven in his glorified resurrected body, then I'm just saying that you're not believing what the gospel says. Uh, Kevin pointed out, it's saying the question is that he still has a human body. Well, if they believe he rose from the dead, he obviously rose, he was buried and then the body's not there anymore. So he rose in that body, but it's glorified now because Paul says we'll be changed, right? In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. So his body was just mere mortal human, but was glorified. And what that glorification looks like, I don't know. None of us know. It doesn't tell us anything except there are bodies celestial and bodies terrestrial. There are bodies that are mortal and the bodies that are immortal. And, and that when we're given the resurrection like Jesus, we will be like him, meaning we will have a glorified body. Um, does that make us not human anymore? No, I don't think so. But it does change our bodies. It's clear that it says we shall be changed. So what that looks like, none of us can actually know or put it in scientific terms. So if that's the question, none of us know the details of that. But like Jordan said, it's important to know that he went in there bodily in the tomb and bodily walked out and still had scars on his hands and in his side. It's the same body, just changed, just glorified. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I see somebody say um, in the comment section that uh, the only thing we have to trust in is what Jesus did for us. And that's very true, but we have to understand this resurrection is part of what Jesus did for us. When we're told in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, the gospel that we are to believe in, the most, like, we can all believe Jesus lived. We can all believe Jesus died. The part that requires the faith is the resurrection itself. And we know that Jesus' body is still going to have those same wounds sustained. We know that Jesus is going to have um, holes in the palm of his hands. So, or not the palms, but like the wrists. Um, but that's what I would have to say about that. It's very important to understand how the, the elements present in the resurrection to fully understand what Jesus did for you, because that is the part that's going to require the faith. It's, I mean, for some people, his life and his death may be um, things that require faith, but I feel that there's so much historical, archaeological evidence for his existence. I mean, our entire timeline is divided by BC and AD, his mere existence. Um, along with numerous other things that we can just go on and on about. But it's the resurrection that is what caused so much controversy. It's the resurrection why so many heresies had to have been born, um, because people couldn't justify a missing body in this tomb that was heavenly guarded. Yeah. The, uh, I'm really, uh, one of the 
best uses of my time, I think, over the years has been uh, my study of uh, early church history. And even now, I keep on going back to it, uh, studying it over and over again. And uh, the uh, the heresies uh, over the first few centuries of the, the church history, um, a, lot, a lot of it still persists today, but th these are ancient heres heresies. And, and, and these are the things that the church had to work out over centuries. Um, and even before we had the, the Bible codified or, or canonized, where um, we agreed what the Bible would be, um, most people didn't have the scriptures themselves. So we have to remember that your average believer for centuries, for really even until after the printing press, and even long after that, people didn't own their own Bible. So their knowledge uh, was was very very limited compared to what we we have now, so the, the 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 leading theologians were the ones that were responsible for studying these things and 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 uh, trying to figure it all out. But uh, the, uh, the one of the oldest heresies is uh, 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 Arianism, uh, uh, where they they don't believe Jesus is God. He's he's just a man that was. Um, um, baptized and the spirit of God came into him, but he was just a man. And then you, you've got the Gnostics and they believe the exact opposite, that uh, Jesus was um, uh, God in a sense, but he didn't have a body. It was just a, an illusion because the material world is evil. And therefore, uh, Jesus couldn't really have a material body. And of course, in the scriptures, that's part of the things we get from from Paul is that, uh, hey, yeah, Jesus had a body and there was an actual resurrection. And, and then the other thing is this idea about hyper, uh, hyper um, uh, preterism where they think that all the prophecies have already been done, including the resurrection of the world. And the, the scriptures say, no, Paul says, no, the resurrection hasn't happened yet. So a lot of these things we have to realize that um, it took a long time for uh, a lot of this to be uh, clarified and codified for us. Now we have a lot of answers, and it, uh, it's not too hard to, to get to the bottom of all these things. But Christians throughout history d did not have these the benefits we have. So I, I personally believe that Jesus is eager to save. And uh, there are people, as I said, uh, some people we used to work with, uh, they they were really quite uh, demanding in terms of the checklist of points that you had to understand and believe this and this and this and this and this. It seemed like the list got bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and uh, um, so you really had to be quite a theologian before you could be, be saved. And uh, I, I think that, I don't think Jesus, if, if someone went before Jesus, and, and uh, they said, well, I believe this and this. He said, well, you didn't study long enough. You should have studied more because you had to know all these things too. So go back, you know, it's too late now. But, you know, or you're asking, Jesus, save me. He says, no, you don't know enough yet. Uh, I think he's eager to save. And, uh, uh, but it is clear that uh, the, the bodily resurrection uh, uh, is, is essential in that uh, Jesus had to show, had to overcome death, show that he has power over life and death. So some people believe there was a resurrection, but it was only a spiritual resurrection, not, not bodily. And we have the problem with the Sibelianism, uh, which today is called um, modalism. And uh, they have the problem that you, you were referring to, Renee, is that they even today are in a position where they would have to say that Jesus does not exist in bodily form today. You know why? Because they think that the Godhead... He's the same uh, person as the Father. <laughs> yeah, but he, he operates in one mode at a time. He was the Father, and then he became the Son, and now he's the Holy Spirit. But he can't exist all three at the same time, or otherwise you have polytheism. So uh, that, that's the difference. We believe the Godhead is three, uh, concurrent. They're all existing just like at the baptism. You had the Jesus there getting baptized. You had the Holy Spirit ascending in the manner of a dove. You had the Father speaking, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Three distinct personages all there at the same time. 
So uh, it's easy to show the, the problem of modalism, but that is one of the false teachings that uh, was prominent and, and persists today. The, the, yep. uh, uh, the Pentecostals, uh, the Church of Christ, uh, they're all modalists, don't, yep. don't believe in the, the triunity of the Godhead. Yep. Uh, I wanted to answer somebody said, but what about flesh and blood can inherit? Well, that just means if you're born in the first Adam, you need another birth. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom, meaning mortal man in, in Adam cannot inherit the kingdom. He requires a new spiritual birth into the second Adam, Jesus Christ. He is not flesh and blood. He's flesh and bone. That's why he said, feel here, I'm flesh and bone. Um, so I do, I do not believe that in our glorified bodies, we have blood. But Jesus is clear that he's flesh. He ate. He sat down and ate with them. And he did have a body, a physical body. It was just a glorified physical body. It's different from the flesh and blood we have now, but Paul says we'll be changed. We'll be changed. Those that are still alive, they'll be changed. And those that are dead in Christ, have died in Christ, we know we don't say death, we say sleep. They will come with him and they'll be given their bodies. And it's a glorified body, but it's still a physical body. So, um, when it says flesh and blood can't inherit, it means when a person that is born and is in the first Adam cannot inherit the kingdom. They meet, they need the second birth, the one born of God that doth not commit sin. The seed of Christ is in him and he can't sin. The seed of Christ cannot sin. So um, that's the difference. That's why that's being said there. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, Jordan, would you like to say more? No, actually, I think that was a really good point, and that's something I try to hammer home because there's a lot of legalists that use First John that you, you won't sin if you're saved, and that's not what it's saying at all. And First John really was all about combating um, Gnosticism, which placed such an emphasis on matter being evil, which is why we kind of see this different dialogue in the letters of First John, and I would even say Second John. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I have some views on First John. You've heard me talk about it a little bit, but overall, I, I never had a lot of confidence that I really got it. But uh, recently, I w watched a, a video by um, Brother uh, Kevin uh, of um, um, Beyond Beyond the Fundamentals. Uh, he his specialty is contra Calvinism, but he's um, uh, he did a, uh, a teaching on First John, and he went through it verse by verse, and his view on it was different than anything I've ever heard. And I'm inclined to think he's got it right, but I'm not going to say anything because I don't know well enough to teach on it yet. But when we get through the Pauline epistles and finally get to First John, I feel I'm, I feel like now I have something uh, to, to offer when we get there because I, I was not quite confident. Uh, so. Uh, Renee, uh, I'll, I'll surprise you with all that when the time comes. <laughs>